Welcome to Champions of Data and AI, brought to you by Databricks. In each episode, we salute champions of data and AI, the change agents who are shaking up the status quo. These mavericks are rethinking how data and AI can enhance the human experience. We'll dive into their challenges and celebrate their successes, all while getting to know these leaders a little more personally. Welcome to the Champions of Data and AI. I'm your host, Chris D'Agostino. When people think of data-driven organizations, they normally are inclined to think about companies such as Google, Netflix, and Uber. However, there are very large data-driven organizations that have thrived for several generations because of how they are using data to make informed business decisions. Today, I'm joined by Pallav Sharma, Chief Data Science Officer at Johnson & Johnson, to discuss what it means to be data-driven at an iconic brand that's been around for over 130 years. This includes the importance of having a well-curated data layer for all of their data types, structured, semi-structured, and unstructured data, in order to serve all the data and AI use cases throughout the company. Yeah, so let's uh, let's get started. So you've had an interesting career. You know, you've been a marketer. You've done data analytics uh, for you know, from a customer service perspective. You've done B two B and B two C uh, environments. Um, you know, what has been the consistent experience throughout your career that has gotten you to where you are today? Yeah, that's a great question. Like if I reflect uh, on my journey, uh, one thing that has remained true is the power of data and the power of insights. What has really happened over the years is we are generating more data, more information. We are harvesting more. Uh, the tools have become significantly better. And, and that has driven a tremendous productivity increase and disruption of many industries and companies. And data has become pretty much central to any process or any business, right? So it's exciting to see in my last 20 years journey that continuously data is becoming, you know, pretty core to the business. And, uh, you know, every business, every industry is trying to leverage the data more, right? So that has been the continuous uh, truth all along. And I see that trend, you know, not weakening ever. It, it is becoming stronger and stronger. We are generating more data. We are, you know, harvesting more information. We are mining more. The tools are getting better. The platforms are getting better. Yeah, that's great. And then we'll give give the audience sort of an example of like what is a typical day for you in terms of you know obviously we're in this remote work scenario, but under normal circumstances, what is what is life like for you when you go to the office? Yeah, so I I, I lead the whole uh, data and digital part for our supply chain in in Johnson and Johnson, and uh, it's a very large and complex supply chain. We are we are a very global organization. We have uh, you know hundreds of sites manufacturing, warehousing, transportation, quality processes all over the world. We have hundreds of thousands of SPUs. Uh, my typical day-to-day -day life starts with you know uh, reviewing uh, a lot of important programs where data is sent at the core of it. Right. So, for example, are we producing the right amount of the product in the right places? Uh, what is our you know inventory situation? How are, how are our dashboards performing? How are our data science and AI uh, algorithms performing? What is the business value? We all start from there, right? It's all about how do we serve our patient better. It starts from there, uh, and then how do we make sure that our employees and our businesses are doing well, right? So across dozens or hundreds of programs, you know, where data illuminates our supply chain. It drives better decision making. That has that becomes my core job, you know, day in day out to make sure that these programs are running well. We are laying down the foundation for a data centric culture. We are actually lifting the capabilities across the organization, and uh, and we are you know really focused on top tier talent, right, to make sure that uh, our businesses and our uh, products keep on getting you know uh, better by the day. Yeah, you know, being in the Bay Area and the West Coast, it's, uh, I would say it's one of the least favorable time zones to be in when you've got global operations. Like I work with customers globally and, you know, you're immediately eight hours behind the UK on a given day, you know, and it, it just gets worse and worse as you go around the globe. How do you handle, how do you handle that transition? Do you find yourself in meetings at two in the morning? 
not not too, but but yeah, definitely the day starts early in most of the time, right? I mean, uh, we do have colleagues all over the world. Uh, you know, we have uh, a strong West Coast operation. We have an office in Seattle, in Bay Area, in Southern California, but then we have a big presence in the East Coast and Europe, in the UK. And I also have teams in Singapore and India, so pretty much all over the world, right? So the day starts early, uh, you know, and then it goes till around, I would say, 6 p.m. Eastern, Eastern time, and the West Coast starts. After that, uh, you know, I get some breather, and then uh, our Asia Pacific colleagues start, right? So, but it's, it's fun. It's fun to kind of, you know, it's exciting to talk about the latest and greatest work that people are doing. I'm always uh, super impressed about the ingenuity of people uh, and uh, but yeah these are these are days long days but we try to take breaks in between to make sure that it's not becoming a continuous series of many many meetings right but yes west coast time is is not very uh, very conducive <laughs> to to global operations so you have uh, you know you have this global presence these you know regional based data sets i would imagine right based on sort of the supply chain and manufacturing that's happening in country uh, you know, the data architecture and data analytics is, is a really important piece, but oftentimes organizations are getting started with some new data insights and they may not have a completely fully baked data architecture. They're doing some, you know, proof of concepts. Uh, give us your point of view in terms of that balance between moving quick and maybe having less rigor and, you know, the architecture completely defined and, and buttoned up versus you know, when does that eventually catch up to you and start causing problems? That's a great question, right? And, and uh, we see our role. I mean, my role is at an enterprise level, uh, supporting all businesses, all supply chains all over the world and quality and sustainability and procurement. So we see our role as more of a catalyst and enabler and then making sure that we, we empower people to do the, their best work wherever they are. To do to make their best decisions wherever wherever they are. So I don't particularly see a conflict between moving fast and doing that in an architecturally robust manner. In fact, because if you do that in an architecturally robust manner, you will move fast, right? So what what we try to do is we uh, we would think of it like uh, like a large you know operating system where we provide. Uh, our team, you know, provides the common data layer, uh, making sure that all the data is pulled in one place and ready to be used, making sure that all the, you know, data curation and cleansing has been taken care of so the data scientist and the visualization expert do not have to, you know, keep on going into cleaning the data or extracting the data and so on, right? So we, we provide that platform with what we call our digital stack, and then we provide some core uh, products on top of it, like forecasting or natural language processing or image analytics, right? So that actually, you know, liberates people closer to the business to start using this rapidly, right? So, so we do encourage people to do a lot of test and learn, a lot of POCs, but also we give them this, this platform, uh, you know, on which they can do this faster, you know, faster experimentation rather than thinking about infrastructure, thinking about data platform, thinking about you know, uh, core services on a cloud platform, we take care of that and we do make sure that it's uh, open to everyone platform and they, they can actually, you know, move much faster and while not worrying about the foundational layers. So, so that is our goal. Yeah. And, and that is actually driving a lot of uh, innovation, a rapid innovation across the company because that's, that's what one needs to do that, right? How do you democratize? How do you lift the whole thing up? Not single credit by making it, you know, uh, a pretty hardcore and closed uh, ecosystem, and also not kind of giving any guidance and having, you know, almost a chaos, which is hundreds of conflicting projects, right? So the truth is somewhere in between. The sweet spot is somewhere in between. So Palav, I know Johnson and Johnson's been around for over 130 years, and many of our viewers may not realize that, but I'm sure you've had all manner of data ecosystem and platform architectures and things like that. When we last spoke, you talked about how Hadoop was really important in the journey and I'd like to talk a little bit more about how you're supplementing some of the workloads that are done there with some of the you know, cloud-based initiatives at J&J. &J. Absolutely, and you're right, Chris, right? We are a 130-year-old uh, company. We actually want to think of ourselves as a 130-year-old startup. 
so innovation is in our DNA. We are a science-driven, engineering-driven company. Uh, our products are, are really, really complex products. Uh, they are life-saving products, and then they, they matter a lot to, to our customers and patients and so on. Uh, I think, uh, you know, our journey has been uh, continuously evolving, right? We, are, we have multi-generational technologies in our uh, in our stack, right? I mean, uh, and then we, we also acquire and divest companies and bring many more technologies, right, from all over the place. So in that situation, right, as, as I came on board uh, a few years ago, one thing that was clear, again, going back to the center is business value, right? We centered on how do we create more business value, more value for our patients, our doctors, customers, mothers, and fathers, right? better, faster, uh, and make sure that our uh, our whole ecosystem, internal and external, are evolving faster, right? So if you think from that perspective, there were many use cases. For example, how do we monitor a real time, right? Uh, hundreds or thousands of lines all over the world and make sure that our yield is, is optimized. How do we predict inventory? How do we do demand sensing? How do we actually collaborate with our external uh, partners rapidly in close to real time, right? Both on the customer side as well as on the supplier side. So these use cases, you know, made us think about leveraging the modern architecture, the cloud-based architecture, machine learning, AI, API first architecture. And we have been on that journey because that has supplemented and really complemented our analytics stack. So we, we have a bouquet of technologies, but now we are really leveraging these modern platforms and they are showing great results. That's great. Can you talk a little bit since, you know, you, you mentioned the, the different use cases, you know, in a globally distributed organization that you run, how do you look at project investments and how do you, how do you work to ensure that you're not unnecessarily duplicating effort, right? You might want to sort of do a trade-off um, and horse race two concepts and two implementations, and that's all great. But if you're really looking to be very efficient and you've got confidence in the teams, you want to make sure that the work's not being duplicated. How do you manage that? That's a great question, right? And I think uh, one has to be very really cautious about it. Uh, and again, uh, the balance is very important, right? Because on the one hand, we want to definitely encourage innovation at all levels and experimentation at all levels. And we do encourage people and try to make the decision close to what is happening. And on the other hand, we have to make sure that, you know, we are all doing things in an accretive manner, which is building on top of each other so that we are not duplicating things, right? So the way we go about these things are, you know, we, uh, in, in some cases, in a, in a platform model, for example, you know, we can give a very good uh, guidance to the organization that all the data should come to the common data layer, right? And everybody should try to, you know, connect their analytics well, workload or the visualization workload or the BI workload to the same common data layer. People do see value in that, right? Because why would somebody want to unnecessarily extract and clean the data which is already provided for them, right? So once they see value, it becomes uh, it becomes a common thing, right? So providing the large organizations, you know, the right platform, the right enable enablers and evangelizing it goes a long way. And then on the other hand, we also have a very disciplined process of managing innovation. We try to do things initially in a small manner. We call them, instead of calling them proof of concept, we call them test and learn because everything is a learning. So we do a small test and learn, and then from rapidly from there, we scale, right? Once we understand that which technology or which platforms will work better, we rapidly scale, right? So, so both, both the points, one is not just you know, giving people a, a, a top-down message about what can be and what should be done, but actually enabling them, empowering them, and making them, you know, see the benefit of the modern technology so that they will align better. And two, having a disciplined and a streamlined innovation process that has helped us. I mean, but it's, it's, it's again a journey, and, and we keep on optimizing as we go along. Yeah, that's great, Palab. One of the things that we're doing at Databricks is, is talking to our customers and prospective customers about that data layer and the need to have that as clean as possible. And you know the, the benefits of making sure you're really consistent with how you curate the data, cleanse the data, ensure its security, 
uh, so that it can be done once so that you're operating in a more efficient way and you're enabling these downstream use cases and you know, just being able to, as you said, empower the teams to do more with the data that you already have and that you've worked with and curated once. You're right, Chris, and, and I think that that can be one of the most important uh, you know initiatives for any large organization to undertake, and that actually unlocks a tremendous amount of potential across the whole organization. Data scientists and data analysts and visualization expert, right? I mean, they they like to do the work on top of clean and curated data because that's what the, 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 that's where they can practice their craft. That's where they are the most productive. You will typically find a lot of uh, feedback about how much time it takes for a data scientist just to get the data, just to clean the data and, and not really focus on their core skills, which is data science, right? And if we can just reduce that friction in the system, we can just empower them, enable them, making sure that they are provided with the right information in the right time with the right latency and the right granularity, right? That goes a long way in unleashing innovation across the whole organization that drives tremendous amount of business value, right? So, so I completely agree that has been one of our biggest focus areas. In addition to, of course, making sure that we have, you know, uh, absolutely latest and greatest and most sophisticated machine learning algorithms working, but all of them, them are dependent on this foundational layer, right? So this is a huge unlock mechanism and, and we are very committed to it. Yeah, this is this is what we're calling at Databricks the lake house architecture. So this idea of trying to combine the benefits of an enterprise data warehouse and all the data governance that goes along with it, with the flexibility of a data lake and the ability to have different workloads for different data types, and you know, combine these two engines, if you will, using low cost cloud based storage. So excited to excited to see you uh, aligned with that. So yeah, Palav, like with with. Johnson & Johnson, I know that you all are users of Databricks, of course. You're using the Delta Lake uh, engine for you know, having that common data layer and, and the data hygiene associated with. Can you tell us a little bit about you know, the use of it and, and why you feel it's a, a, an important part of your architecture? Sure, yeah. I think uh, you know, we have had uh, a lot of you know, progress with Databricks uh, empowering or underpinning our common data layer. If you look at our again business use case, right, we have many, many use cases which in which we require different types of data at different latency. So for example, our planning uh, system might need data at a certain latency, but manufacturing might need real-time data, right? Sourcing might need documents, right? Uh, you know, deliver and logistics might need a real-time feed on temperature and location coming from all over the world, right? And our underlying system landscape, we have hundreds of systems which are actually generating these, these type of data. So Databricks data lake architecture allows us to actually bring all of these together with the right latency, right, at the right cost, such that we can provide a clean data stream to our analytics and visualization layer, right? So we, we work on this three-tier architecture where fundamental IT platforms, and then we have a common data layer, and then we have analytics and visualization on top, right? So to provide and empower analytics and visualization, the Databricks technology, the Delta Lake architecture is actually a, a very good step forward for us because we are able to get a seamless integration across hundreds of systems, different levels of latency and, and real clean you know, data coming out of it that is, that is empowering our end-to-end -end visibility, you know, machine learning workloads like natural language processing, image analytics, forecasting, optimization, and so on, right? So it, it is a, it's an important investment for us, and we are looking forward to generating even more value out of it. So why don't we shift into uh, just learning a little bit about advice you would give other leaders that are aspiring to be chief data science officers or chief data analytics officers, you know, People that are, are looking to you, you know, within your own organization and external to your organization, what types of things, uh, you know, we, do you feel really kind of defined and enabled your career uh, to get where you are today? Sure, right. I, I can think about a few things. Uh, you know, some of these are principles, and you know, we keep on learning as we go ahead, right? Uh, one of the most important thing is, I've mentioned this a couple of times, is the focus on creating business value, being the real and right partners 
of the business and functional leaders who are actually responsible for day to day business performance right enabling them empowering them and thinking always from the perspective of whether this project or this initiative that i am championing and and so passionate about does it really matters to our customers does it really solve a key business problem right a lot of times there are things which are very sophisticated and very interesting and you know i i get very excited about them but sometimes you know they are either far they are too early uh, to go to the market or they are not going to create the right impact right so that's point number one which is focus on business value point number two is think about the scale right uh, you know we can get busy in terms of working on one or two initiative but our job as chief data science officer or chief data analyst officer is actually to empower and enable the whole organization and and lifting the whole organization so it's not only about the work that we or our team directly do but it's all it is more about how do we empower others so that we can unleash and unlock innovation across the organization at the end of the day large and complex organization will require tremendous amount of ex experimentation at all levels in the organization so scale is important and with a scale one has to think about the right amount of architecture right which is what's the right architecture that will get you to scale which is a good balance between you know fast experimentation and rapid decision making locally while adhering to some common standards and and some common architecture right and, and then leveraging the modern technology which is cloud you know api based architecture machine learning ai uh making sure that everything gets connected and so forth right so that's striking the right balance but going for the scale not not getting focused on one or two or three things right yeah i was just going to say you know it's one of the things that we actually have been focused on which is uh we want to enable single node data science to keep the cost down and and really democratize access to you know create those citizen data scientists uh, but what we found with a lot of organizations they're doing it with you know say a laptop and a subset of the data uh, because that's really convenient for for the data scientist to work with but then when they try to move it into the production environment you know the libraries are different versions the the data sets might look a little bit different than what they had downloaded or 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 you know we're working with and so our goal we have uh, the ability to do single node data science on our platform where you've got the same underlying environment and same libraries and the same access to the data, but you're keeping your compute costs way, way down. So um, I, I think it's spot on what you're what you're describing about being innovative and, and kind of locally, but then making sure you can scale it up. Yeah, absolutely. And then that is sometimes it comes across as a conflict, but it is not, right? I mean, as you rightly said, we need to make sure that we 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 build stuff for the scale and we build stuff that runs in production, right? Because otherwise there's no business value connecting it to point number one, right? I mean, we can we can do a lot of interesting work, but unless it hits production, unless it unless it runs in large scalable manner and continuously updates itself, right? uh there's not a lot of business value and finally i would say talent right which which can be actually number one point uh you know this is this whole area is a fast growing you know rapidly improving space right talent is is very very critical how do we attract and retain and motivate the right talent reskill and upskill existing talent right i mean that becomes a game changer right i mean uh, unless so it's not only about the right technology right architecture not only about the right business value and the focus on the right problems but it's also about the right talent and making sure that they are doing the right work in a streamlined manner right so folks who are more engineering and builders they are focused on building the platform folks who are more business uh, process and business knowledge centric they are actually focused on requirements and deployment of of these things right so so having that right operating model with the right talent is also very crucial right so again focus on business value go for the scale and go for the right talent i think those are the things which are very important so that talent uh, point is great and it leads me into i think the next area which is you know developing that culture around data science right recruiting training retaining this top talent is is very expensive and you know plus you get all the institutional knowledge uh the, the longer the more tenure somebody has that you don't want to lose so can you tell me a bit about your just principles around developing a thriving data culture and and what you do to you know and what role that architecture 
in terms of enabling people to be productive and do their best work, what role that plays in your mind for, for that culture? Yeah, sure. And I think this is, this is, again, a very, very important topic, particularly for large organizations, right, which require a lot of domain knowledge and, and knowledge of, you know, navigation across the organization, right? So we, we, we start by saying that, you know, it is going to be a two in a box or a model, right? Because as, as much as one needs the modern technology skills and the data science and machine learning skills, one also needs to, you know, equally important in some cases, more important, the business knowledge, the process, right? How things work, regulations, the knowledge of all of those things, right? So what we try to do is to, we try to, uh, you know, make sure that there is a osmosis happening between these two skill sets, right? I mean, the folks who understand data and AI and machine learning and full stack and the folks who understand business, right? We, we put them together in a common program and then we providing them with the right architecture and the right platform so that they can experiment fast, right? I mean, they, they doesn't, there's not a lot of lag between the idea and the requirement and the build and the deployment, right? So how do we run that thing fast and, and that gets enabled by again a common data layer, a common set of tools, a cloud-based platform, you know, uh, low-cost compute, and so forth. Right. So those platforms and the modern technology actually helps drive this two-in-a-box model. Uh, and then you know we we actually put both these you know uh, people all the skill set, which is more on the data and technical skill set, business and domain knowledge skill set as responsible for the business outcome, right? So we don't want to have this wall in between where somebody is just doing the requirement and somebody is doing a build, but both of them are jointly responsible for, you know, generating business value, right? And the more we showcase these type of collaboration, the better it is, right? Typically, it is very, very hard to find, you know, it's a unicorn kind of a situation where one wants that somebody is a PhD in, in computer science or machine learning and also knows, you know, tremendous amount of chemistry or biology and so forth, right? So we have to make sure that we need to bring these talents together and we need to make sure that, you know, both of them appreciate, right? I mean, the complexity and, and, the, and, and the importance of uh, expertise, right? So, so our data scientist becomes more educated on our manufacturing processes, our, you know, uh, logistics and transportation and quality processes and vice versa. Our, our quality and manufacturing people get more educated on our data science and our platform, right? So, so that's how we are going about it. Thank you for joining this episode of Champions of Data and AI, brought to you by Databricks. Thousands of data leaders rely on Databricks to simplify data and AI, so data teams can innovate faster and solve the world's toughest problems. Visit databricks.com to learn how data leaders are unlocking the true potential of all their data.